Parents and teachers, this video contains a couple of rather unpleasant photographs and descriptions of some horrible experiences. You may wish to review this video before sharing it with your class or family. A very nasty invasive species of plant. The burning sensation was quite horrific. These spines get up to about two inches long and they will go straight through your skin very, very easily. The spikes have a little hook on the end which gets stuck into your flesh and won't let go. Don't be gentle about it. Rip it out very quick. It hurts less. And the agonising pain and the inability to escape from it gave him a heart attack and he died. Hello and welcome back to Curiosity Mine and welcome to the first episode in a new series on bush botany featuring Warwick Schofield and other botany and field experts. If you're anything like me you're probably thinking but plants are boring but the thing is they're not once you get to know them. Also we'll be focusing on plants both native and introduced that have a connection with the Australian opal fields particularly at Lightning Ridge. I'll give Warwick a chance to introduce himself and then we'll get onto the story of the deadly invasive cactus that infests the Australian opal fields and I promise you there's actually zero clickbait in that title. Here's Warwick. I'm Warwick Schofield. I uh, have a university degree in earth science including botany. It's always been an interest of mine the plants. I've been a high school science teacher and for many years an inspector with the New South Wales Department of Mines looking at mine safety and mining and the environment. Warwick and I headed out to the opal fields to have a look at an area that's particularly badly infested with Hudson pear, an invasive cactus species. So here we are, we've got some Hudson pear here, a very nasty invasive species of plant. It was probably introduced to this area around 40 years ago. It pretty certainly originated around Grau and someone has brought it there, with no doubt an opal miner and possibly to protect around his mine or his camp with the vicious spikes. The spikes, the problem is, have a little hook on the end which gets stuck into your flesh and won't let go. And you don't want to mess with this. Some of these types of cactus are called jumping cactus because the people reckon they actually jump at you. But look how easily these segments come loose and fall on the ground. A nasty, nasty story. Very dangerous thing and our wildlife really has suffered. Hudson pear, which is the common name for the cactus, we'll discuss that more in a moment. Hudson pear is a species that originated in the Sonoran Desert, which is an area that covers a chunk of northern Mexico and southern Arizona. And since they've, they've come in probably from South America where they are native, but they're not native here, that's why there's no natural enemy and they've started to spread. And the spreading has, not coincidentally I would believe, not just around all the rural properties here where the koalas and kangaroos and livestock have spread them, but they've popped up in Queensland and South Australia on the opal fields there. So there's certainly a connection that the opal mining has probably brought the thing here and has probably been part of spreading it. Along with floodwaters and wind and now it's, we've just got to be careful it does not get out of control. Some of these spiny cacti, and not just this species, are called jumping cactus because just getting anywhere near the spine it'll flick onto you and hook on. That's how they spread, that's how they reproduce, by vegetative reproduction hooking on to things near them. The cladodes or segments come loose very easily, the spikes very easily are detached and spread by native animals, kangaroos, sheep, cattle, and they're very hard to get out, they'll go right through leather you can see here how easily the cactus spines attach to a car tire. It takes no effort at all and they're really hard to remove once they're attached. It's really important if you've been driving around the opal fields, even in areas where it doesn't look like there's any Hudson pear, that you check your tires and mud flaps and any soft materials underneath your car to make sure that you're not taking any cactus segments with you. Otherwise you might be helping the plant to spread. The spines on a Hudson pear are a masterpiece of evolution and they have several mechanisms that make them so effective at attaching themselves quickly and easily to skin, to leather, to animals, to car tires, etc. Mature cactus spines are a bit like your fingernails. The material they're made of is actually dead. The only living part of a cactus spine is the areole or the bit right at the bottom that grows new material to extend the spine as the cactus grows. Spines are made from dense plant fibers and in the case of Hudson pear, they're very, very hard. 
The spines on a Hudson pear are barbed. It's virtually impossible to see the barbs on a cactus spine without an electron microscope. They are just that tiny, but they are there and they create a texture a bit like fish scales on the surface of the spine that makes it easy to go in, but much harder to pull back out. There's also a very slight hook on the end of the spine. The little hook on the end acts a bit like Velcro. So once you've got a few spines attached at slightly different angles, the cactus gets quite a solid grip on whatever it's attached to. The outside layer of the spine is a papery sheath that protects the spine, but it's also quite removable. We can see here Warwick carefully removing the sheath from a spine. Don't try this at home. This means that when you're injured by the cactus, removing the spines will sometimes leave behind this sheath, which can cause irritation and sometimes even infection. It's a genuinely nasty mechanism and it works very, very well. We had one human attributed death from falling in to Hudson Pear. The pain was so intense basically that they had a heart attack and pretty much died on the spot. I would call a Hudson pear a deadly plant. And I say that because we know that a man, I think out near Grawan, had stumbled one night, fallen into one of these, and the agonising pain and the inability to escape from it gave him a heart attack and he died. And it was the Hudson pear that killed him. A dreadful plant. The cactus is also deadly to animals. We do know that Bimble, the popular little koala that used to hang around town, named after the Bimble box trees, got hooked up in a Hudson pear, trying to chew it out of his paws, got it in his mouth, and not even a vet could save him. So it is a deadly plant. We know that it's nasty, and we do know also of serious personal injury to a person, and no doubt there's other incidents where if we hadn't warned people to keep away from this plant, there will be, and could be ongoing, serious, serious, deadly incidents associated with this nasty plant. We found plenty of dead native animals in these. If it's a bird trying to get something, it basically just drags them straight into the plant. They don't stand a chance. We've had calves, we've had lambs with it in their snout. Their mothers won't let them feed from them, so they basically starve to death. It's the same with the dog. First thing it does is reaches around, tries to bite the piece out, and it just pins their mouth together, so they eventually starve or die of infection. And if you don't look after yourself, the same thing can happen to you. These spines get up to about two inches long and they will go straight through your skin very, very easily. And it's not just deadly, it's also capable of causing pretty serious injury and in some cases immobilising a person with pain and shock. I spoke with Sean Galman, who you may remember from these videos, about an experience he had with Hudson Pear many, many years ago, way back before the cactus was so widespread. So my experience with Hudson Pear is one that I fondly recall, and it wasn't a pleasant one at all. It took place about 1993. I would have been 13 years old at the time. And uh, just clearing a path and being pretty young and inexperienced with Hudson Pear at that time, because I don't think we'd really encountered it in the early 90s all that much. Uh, I thought just a long handled shovel and keep my distance from it and knock it down. And in my infinite wisdom of being a kid and wearing open toed sandals, as soon as I started to break it apart and knock it down with the, with the shovel, a piece flicked straight back at me through the air and landed right across my leg, a piece maybe a foot or so long. And I ended up with 107 spines in the back of my leg. And even the nurses at the hospital hadn't experienced anything like that at that point, because it was pretty new to them, having a big, large piece of Hudson pear in, stuck in someone. Uh, the pain wasn't really there. I didn't experience much in the way of pain, but upon removing them, the burning sensation was quite horrific with each one that was pulled out of the, the 107 spines. It took three nurses two hours to get them out with pliers. I had seven remain in the tendon in the back of the, the ankle. But yeah, that was uh, quite an unpleasant experience. It's not a thing that is to be taken lightly, that's for sure. And that's just one of dozens upon dozens of stories of people being injured, sometimes pretty significantly, by Hudson Pear. I have a scar on my finger from where I brushed past a clump of Hudson Pear as a child and one of the spines went into my cuticle and tore my finger open. Another story that was relayed to me was of a visitor who didn't realise they had a piece of Hudson Pear attached to the heel of their boot and then they knelt down and they impaled themselves 
holes in the backside with the same piece. So they had glued their boot to their butt with a piece of cactus. They needed to actually have another person come and lift them up by the shoulders because the pain was so excruciating they couldn't move and they couldn't separate their boot from their backside. It's just nasty. And you really need to be incredibly careful if you know that Hudson Pear is around and you still need to be alert even if you think it isn't. You kind of have to be a little bit in awe of Hudson Pear. It is not a beautiful cactus by any stretch of the imagination. It's actually, it's pretty ugly, but it's really achieved something as far as evolution goes. Now, I can only do so much research on the internet before I lose the will to live, but it seems to me that there aren't a lot of cactus that can legitimately claim that they've killed people. The saguaro cactus, which is found in Arizona, it's the largest cactus on earth and it grows to around 18 to 20 meters tall, which is enormous. In 1982, a man was killed when he attempted to cut down a saguaro by shooting at it after which it fell on him and killed him. Now, I would argue that the fact that it weighed a quarter of a ton and it fell down was the reason it killed him and not the fact it was a cactus. Anything that weighs a quarter of a ton and falls on you might just kill you. So given that Hudson Pear is recorded to have killed someone by actually injuring him with its spines until he went into shock, panic and cardiac arrest, I think that makes Hudson Pear conclusively maybe a more deadly cactus possibly the most deadly cactus possibly on earth look i hate the stuff but i have to admit it's certainly an impressive organism that deserves some level of respect we originally called it thistle chola was the name thistle chola but it's a to the scientific community it's a cylindro puntia it's a cylindrical uh, succulent cactus. It's been renamed a couple of times and it's now currently Cylindropuntia pallida. Cylindropuntia pallida is this one. It has a reddish coloured flower, which most people have rarely seen. There is a similar Cylindropuntia, which has a yellow coloured flower and a pinky coloured spines on it, but very similar and just as nasty. In its native Mexico, I've been told that they call the stuff El Dente Diablo, or the Devil's Teeth, which is certainly pretty appropriate. It's also referred to as the Devil's Rope, which works for me also. And sometimes it's called Jumping Cactus, as Warwick mentioned earlier, as well as Jumping Chola or Jumping Choya, if you want to use the Spanish pronunciation. Although there's a bit of confusion from country to country about which cactus does the jumping. In Mexico and the USA, Jumping Choya is a different species of Cylindropuntia to Hudson Pear or anything that we might call Jumping Cactus in Australia. And that leads me to a bit of a misconception about Hudson Pear. Hudson Pear, the common name for the plant, does not come from the name of the person who introduced the cactus to the opal fields. From all of my research, it seems to me that no one actually knows who that was, and it's probably potentially a good thing because I don't think they'd be making any friends. The plant itself is actually named after the person who first brought the plant to the attention of the Prickly Pear Commission, and they started the ball rolling to have it listed as, an, as a dangerous invasive species and to begin the eradication process. So it's not named after anyone currently local to Lightning Ridge, and it's definitely not named for the person responsible for bringing it to the area. So please don't blame Mr. Hudson for the existence of Hudson Pear. It's not his fault. Mr. Hudson is the good guy. He did the right thing and started the process of eliminating the thing in the first place. And speaking of eradication and elimination, where do we go from here? Well, there have been attempts in the past to eliminate Hudson Pear using some pretty conventional methods, such as spraying with herbicides and physically removing the stuff. Warwick was involved with the organisations who conducted these initial removal methods. So in the early days, the opal miners were one of the first that recognised the presence of Hudson Pear in the district. And the opal miners were really concerned and took this to government. A task force was formed which included the Lightning Ridge Miners Association and we worked hard in the first instance to have the plant actually identified and legally recognised with its scientific name. The Miners Association, uh, working in with landholders, were able to obtain chemicals when they were finally 
uh, license to be used on this plant and backpacks were used and volunteers were used to travel throughout the opal fields and private landholders also on quad bikes were able to access the chemical and were going around spot spraying the Hudson Pear which we then knew it as. The initial methods were somewhat successful but it turns out that the cactus is just too tenacious and despite poisoning and burning and burying it continues to spread but there is good news i spoke with matt at castle ray macquarie county council the organization that is responsible for the latest advanced eradication methods about how the problem is now being approached see those little dots that look like dirt on the spines they're actually the crawlers these little crawlers are cochineal scale insects there are four species, in fact, that are, that are currently in Australia, but they're very specific in terms of the species of cactus they will attack. So we need to see that we've got the right one when we're infecting the Hudson pear with the cochineal scale insect. This one's Dactylopius tormentosus, uh, Californica parkeri. I don't know who Mr Parker was, but it's finished up with a variety named after him, and that's the exact one of the four that will attack the Hudson pear. So they're the babies that are going to go to the next plant. So they crawl to the top of the spines and in their back they've got little waxy filaments which they use kind of as sail and then the wind will take them to the next plant. You might know cochineal from its other use which is as a dye or a food colouring. Cochineal dye which is also called carmen is harvested from the bodies of dead female cochineal scale insects. So yeah if you've ever eaten anything that's all natural and very very red you might have eaten some bugs. Scale insects are an order of insects with some pretty weird characteristics. Most species of scale insects have a really extreme sexual dimorphism, which means that there's a huge difference between the males and the females of the species. The males are much smaller, less than half the size of the female and have wings and they can fly around. And the female is a tiny, very vulnerable, soft, bright red bug with no wings and practically no legs. So these little white sacs, that's where your females are and they're what's called sessile. They've got a single mandible mouth so they attach to the plant then they form that waxing covering over it and that's incubating their eggs basically and they just, she just sits there laying eggs so she'll never move again but she's the one doing the damage. So they're draining all the nutrients out of the plant until they basically just starve it to death. The protective shell that they build, the thick white waxy coating, is called scale, which is why the insects are called scale insects. So basically what we're seeing here is how the cochineal works. So where the females have been established, they're starting to stru uh, drain all the nutrients out of the plant. And you can see these points where it's starting to yellow off, which means the plant is very sick and it's actually starting to die off. So as we get a few more numbers into this plant, it'll basically just drain all the nutrients out and the whole plant will turn like that and just basically collapse on itself. And uh, we've experienced that once it's dead from cochineal, it doesn't come back. Um, sometimes they'll fight for their life and they'll start reshooting little uh, segments, but the cochineal will just catch up with it and um, kill it completely. Matt gave us a tour of the biological control facility at Lightning Ridge where the cochineal scale insects are prepared and cactus segments are infected with the insects in preparation to be taken out onto the fields and distributed onto the infestations of Hudson Pear. So we get clean material from the field, we put them in tubs, we'll just place the infected cladode on top and then it just filters down through the cladodes that are in there. And once they're covered in bio, we go and release them into the environment then collect more fresh material and bring it back here and start the process again. So the facility holds about 850 tubs and that's what we aim to turn around every year, at least that 850. So it averages out about 50 cladodes a tub. We're up to about 60,000 cladodes that we've put out now. So the process of getting cochineal into these is literally just throwing a cladode into the plant? Uh, throwing about 50 cladodes into the plant, into the bigger plants. The idea is, like, so, so it's basically you got your, your snowball effect so the further it goes, the bigger it gets, the more damage it does. So the idea is to try and get the numbers up as quick as possible. And by putting in like 50 cladodes just in a heap, we'll throw it in. So that means they've got shelter from the elements from the top. 
so all the cochineal underneath can get established quite safely. A lot of work goes into making sure that a biological control method like cochineal doesn't have any unforeseen outcomes. Before it can be released out into the system, um, it has to sit in quarantine. It has to do compatibility tests, it has to do native range tests. So the average um, biocontrol will take about seven years from coming to the country to being allowed to be released out into the environment. That's if it's allowed. So we got pretty lucky with this and they only had to do three years of testing from when it landed. Um, so they just make sure that it's not going to get into any fruits, anything like that. The good thing is that Australia doesn't have a native cactus, so there isn't a lot of natives that uh, the cochineal can do damage to. They're very, very host specific. It'll only eat this and one other invasive cactus. Um, all the other cactuses have a different variety of cochineal that attack them. When they do the host range testing um, in the quarantine facilities, they will actually basically sit in a cage and they'll put it in the middle then they'll line up all the natives around it and then the actual host that we want it to get on. And over time, over years, they give it years to see if it'll attack the natives um, and what happens to it. So basically, if it doesn't have Hudson pear, the cochineal just dies out. It's its only food source apart from Polyphora. And we got very lucky with that because that'd be the next one to take over after Hudson pear dies out. The cochineal scale insect program is succeeding so far, but it will need to be augmented with conventional removal methods and a lot of community support going forward. But somehow I don't think it'll be that hard to get the community behind a project to eradicate such a horrible, damaging, painful, and ultimately deadly plant. The cochineal is not a silver bullet. It never will be. We'll never eradicate Hudson pear, but we're just gonna get it down to a controllable level where as the plants pick up, the bio will pick up. As the plants die down, the bio will die down with it because it's their own only food source. Um, so yeah, the message that we're trying to get at the moment is we need to keep it where it is. So we need to spray our boundaries, our tracks, our roads, just to make sure it's not getting carted on vehicles and things like that. People sometimes ask, I mean, what do they do when they come across a Hudson pear? It's a very simple answer, keep well away. This is nasty, nasty stuff, keep well away. So basically if you're up here for tourism and you want to see the place, you'd rather that you stayed on all the main tracks, all the main roads, don't drive off through the bush because as you can see, this falls apart quite easily. That will stick in your tyres, it'll stick in your mud guards. We found them in boot seals underneath the car. We found them on spare tyres underneath cars. Uh, and they attach that well that we've had one carted from here at Lightning Ridge all the way to Forbes before the person discovered that it was in the spare tyre of their caravan. So they did the right thing and handed into LLS. So basically when you're walking around, you need to look down to make sure you're not treading in these smaller plants. They'll easily go through your thongs, your sneakers, don't walk around this area without boots on. If you do get one in you, you need a pair of pliers or something like that. Don't be gentle about it. Rip it out very quick, it hurts less. If you do discover that you've driven away with one and you end up into a major town or something like that, try and get in contact with your, the local weeds officer is your first point of call. Let them dispose of it. If you have no other choice, uh, into a red lid bin, so it's going into landfill, uh, make sure that it gets buried. Uh, without sunlight, these things will die, so if it is underground and buried properly, it won't reproduce. I also ask Warwick and Matt for advice for anyone who lives locally in case they come across Hudson pear growing around their home, on their mining claim, or on their property. If it's close to your camp or where you live or it's interfering with your normal workplace, there are several uh, matters that are available. One of them is that there is a registered chemical spray and it can be made up, mixed with dye, and it needs to be sprayed thoroughly all over the cladodes, all around, not just a little bit here and there. Completely spray the plant, and within a month or so, it will shrink down and die. But you must come back and check that there wasn't a cladode survived, and you need to kill it as well. So spraying does work, it does kill it. As well as spraying, there are other ways that we can handle it. If it's a small, look at that beautiful big butterfly. Oh my goodness, look at him. Another way is if it's a small plant is to dig it up with a gouging pick, being really careful. Remember number one advice, keep away. Dig it up and you could make even a little heap and they will burn. 
they'll burn quite well some sticks and maybe a little bit of diesel or something and they'll burn quite well and that's the end of them, they will kill it. If you're local up around the ridge growing area, everything like that and you've got concerns that it's moving further towards you or you're getting new growth and things like that, contact me, your local weeds officer, uh, you can contact Walgatshire Council or you can, depending where it is, you can contact the Opal Trust Reserve and hopefully if it's on their land, the land manager will take care of the problem for you. If you need to handle Hudson Pear to remove it from your vehicle, either use pliers or metal tongs to touch the cactus itself. If you need to remove a plant from your property, be sure to wear boots and remember that this stuff is called jumping cactus for a reason. The pieces fall off very easily and the spines are springy, so the pieces bounce. And all it takes is brushing past a piece for it to attach to your clothing or to your skin, so do be careful. It's also worth mentioning that just because Hudson Pear is dead, it doesn't mean it's not still dangerous. When Hudson Pear dies, the green parts disintegrate and turn to dust, but the spines last forever. But at least once it's dead, it can't spread anymore. Be careful. If you need help to deal with Hudson Pear, please reach out to the experts and get the right advice. Nobody wants this stuff around and your help to report outbreaks of the cactus and to potentially remove it with the right advice and safety measures, it'll go a long way to helping to eliminate this stuff as much as possible. I also recommend that you check out the Northern Slopes Landcare YouTube channel which has a really great playlist of informational videos about Hudson Pear, offering a lot of useful information and advice, and they have a lot more technical detail on the use of cochineal and conventional elimination methods against Hudson Pear. I'd also like to thank Northern Slopes Landcare and Castlereagh Macquarie County Council for allowing me to use some footage from their videos in this video project also. So that is Hudson Pear, the deadly cactus that infests primarily the Australian opal fields, but is becoming a larger and more national problem. This is not a Lightning Ridge problem. We're on the edge of the Murray-Darling Basin system. And a good flood will pick these up, these segments, so easily detached, and we've found individual specimens of this now all the way down to the Victorian border within the Murray-Darling Basin. Please be cautious if you visit the opal fields, particularly at Lightning Ridge and Grawan, but also at the fields in Queensland and South Australia. Hudson Pear is a very, very nasty organism and it will hurt you if you're not careful around it. This video was made with the support and participation of the Castlereagh Macquarie County Council and Warwick Schofield, with special thanks to Matt Savage of Castlereagh Macquarie and to Margaret Schofield. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Curiosity Mine on YouTube and following along on all of the usual social media channels. The links are in the description. And thank you for watching.